We've had our fair share over the years of controversial things from The Chosen, but it seems like episode three of season four may be the biggest moment yet for a lot of different reasons. And it seems like there are so many different thoughts that people have about this episode in particular. Now, of course, we're going to deep dive into this episode when it comes out on the app. But for now, let's give an overview and show you exactly what's going on in this episode. Let's talk about each scene and the importance of the storytelling overarching throughout these first three episodes and in particular, this third one here. There's a lot to talk about, so let's dive in. Now, if you haven't seen our first two episodes of overviews for The Chosen Season 4, make sure you go ahead and do that. This episode in particular, I think people are going to have the most thoughts about and comments too. So make sure you leave your comments down below as you're watching this video. Feel free to leave as many comments as you like, and I'll read through all of them as we have conversation about this episode overall. Make sure you like the video and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. It's a huge help as we start to grow this ministry and do more things with The Chosen Sleuth, talking about all types of Christian media, including The Chosen upcoming in season four and season five when they begin to film in just a couple of months. So you're going to want to be here for that. But without further ado, let's dive in to episode Episode three. The first thing that we start with is actually a flashback. This is something that happens a lot in The Chosen. Ever since season one, we've seen these flashbacks, and they are very, very important to show you exactly how the episode is going to go. This episode is no different. In fact, the writing over time, I feel like, has gotten more polished, more succinct in what they're trying to teach you and what they're trying to show you in every single episode. This episode in particular starts with David and Bathsheba. Now, if you're not familiar with this, David for a long time was in the wilderness on the run away from the first king of Israel named Saul. Now, during that time, Saul tried to kill him. He tried to kill him because he knew that David was supposed to be the king of Israel upcoming, and he was afraid that David was going to take his place. And of course, that does eventually happen, but during a portion of David's life, he's on the run away from Saul. This is important because of the people that he is with. One of those people is called Uriah the Hittite. This is one of David's best best friends, his mighty men, someone that was alongside him and defended him while he was on the run. Now, when he eventually does become king, Uriah the Hittite is still in his army, fighting for him at war, and it becomes a really big thing. During this time in history, kings didn't stay home. They went to war with their soldiers, but in this case, David doesn't. While he's king during this time, he sends his soldiers out, including his mighty men, including his friends that he had traveled with while he was on the run. And this causes a lot of issues for him. This is his first step where he went wrong. When he's at home, instead of being at war, he sees a woman bathing naked on her roof. This just so happens to be his friend Uriah's wife, Bathsheba. And he ends up sleeping with Bathsheba and getting her pregnant. This causes a ton of different issues, including trying to cover up this whole incident by killing his friend Uriah. This is a really big deal. And of course, God did not look favorably on David's actions during this time. And the baby that was born to David and Bathsheba lives for seven days and then dies. This is what we're seeing at the beginning of this episode. You see, Nathan the prophet had actually already told David ahead of time that this baby was going to die. And we can actually see this in 2 Samuel chapter 12, starting in verse 14. It says, Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the child who is born to you shall die. And then Nathan went to his house. Then we see this main section here in which I'd highlighted a portion of the story so that we can read through it. And the Lord afflicted the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and he became sick. David, therefore, sought God on behalf of the child, and David fasted and went in and lay on, on, all night on the ground, and the elders of his house stood beside him to raise him from the ground, but he would not, nor did he eat food with them. On the seventh day the child died, and the servants of David were afraid to tell him that the child was dead. And they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he did not listen to us. How then can we say to him that his child is dead? He may do, so, do himself some harm. But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David understood that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, Is the child dead? They said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothes. And he went into the house of the Lord and worshipped. So this is David's heart here, right? We see him as he spends those seven days not eating or drinking, but rather praying, asking God to intervene in the situation in which David knows that he has no power 
And that's something that a king normally doesn't have, but he has to rely on God here. Now, God does not heal the baby, and that's what we see in the beginning of this scene. We're going to go into this in a deep dive moment later on, but this scene is really telling for the rest of this episode, so it's important that we get a grasp on what the writers are trying to show us here. Now, the second part of this scene is actually a moment with Bathsheba and David as she is clearly still heavily in mourning for their son. And she doesn't understand any of this. She asks questions like, why does God answer some prayers but not others? And David said he doesn't really know, but he trusts God and wants to worship him no matter what the circumstance is, whether that be joyful or sorrow strength, victory, or loss. It's throughout all of it that he will worship God, no matter what. But there is a really key moment here where we get to understand the heart of David and what he understands about this situation altogether. David says that the boy will not come back to them. God has made that very clear. But eventually, they will go to the boy meaning that they'll see him in heaven. This is actually something that's really clear in scripture as well. If we look back at 2 Samuel, he says this, But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. So this is really what we're seeing here during this moment. Um, It's David coming to the realization of, He is going to see his son again, but there's nothing that he can do about it right now. Now, in the show, there's actually a very specific line that David says here. I'll read it for you. So Bathsheba says, the separation is just for now, for a time. And then David says, a time. It could be a long time. It could be tomorrow. This is the way of all things. So keep this in mind as we think about the rest of the episode The reason why this is here in the front portion of the episode is to remind us, and generally, that's going to be a bookend on the end of the episode and the beginning of the episode. So we're going to get there, and we'll explain everything as we go through, but this is obviously a beautiful piece of writing that helps us to understand where this episode's going, and it connects all throughout this episode as well, which we'll point out in just a second. After this scene, we get the intro theme moment, and then we jump into Quintus's office. Now, this is one of the first times that we're seeing Quintus kind of descend into madness. We've seen him in a lot of different states over the last few seasons, and we've seen that he's losing more and more control. Season three, we saw as uh, the sewage system was backing up into the well water, and that caused a lot of issues for the city. Of course, they needed to get that fixed. Gaius and Peter actually took care of that, but there's a lot of things there where he didn't have control and he was getting really upset, but he was able to fix those issues. Now, He's becoming more and more paranoid. There's a lot of things that are happening with him that are causing a lot of different issues. And part of this, I think, has to do with Atticus as well. We saw earlier in this season, the first two episodes, how Atticus was talking with Quintus and really riling him up in some ways. Atticus is warning him that he is on his last leg. That The only thing that he's done well has been the taxes and that his revenues are up. If that goes away, then he has nothing. And he's made that pretty clear. Now, this episode is when we see that Quintus starts to realize he has nothing left. The taxes are no longer up. He starts to do the math and things are not working out for him. And so when he realizes this in his office, he's doing the math on an abacus and doing all these different things. He realizes that his numbers are in the red and that he is not as good as he was revenue wise. This really causes him to fly off the handle. He runs outside as everybody's wondering what he's doing because this is not normal for him. And he begins berating everybody. He even at one point sees Matthew's dog. And I thought he was definitely going to like kick the dog or something. (laughs) I thought that was definitely going to happen, but he didn't. Um, He sees the dog and he sees a beggar and he tells them basically get these dogs out of here, calling the beggar a dog as well as the literal dog. Then he goes to these different vendors and begins to question them about their taxes and what they're doing. And he's yelling at them and he steals uh, a woman's wine. As she starts to complain about it, he says, are you, are you uh, up to date on your taxes? Have you paid all your taxes? Yeah, I didn't think so. This is one of your payments and begins to drink the wine there. So Quintus is obviously losing it here. He's, he's losing his cool. He's not as calm and collected as of a villain as we've seen him previously. His power is being diminished in the eyes of the audience, right? Because he's starting to lose that, um, the, the power that he did have, which was his intellectual sort of prowess, his strategy, um, his authority. 
and, and he no longer seems to have that uh, kind of going into this. He's losing his cool for sure. We're basically seeing Quintus get to this moment of, okay, if you're not going to do it, I'll do it myself. And he begins to yell at all of the different merchants and people that are in the city of Capernaum. Now, at this point, we see as Gaius has been told about what's happening with Quintus and him and Julius rush to the scene to go and try to amend and fix what's happening here. Immediately when Quintus sees Gaius, this goes to the scene that we actually saw a preview of several months ago from Dallas. And this brings us to a point where Quintus is yelling at Gaius and telling him all the things that he's done wrong. Gaius is not listening to Quintus. We already knew that. And now Quintus is really seeing the outcome of why everything is kind of going wrong. And he's blaming a lot of that on Gaius, which to be fair, is kind of true. <laughs> now he says to Gaius that he made him primi and he could strip away that title as well, making him a centurion or something even lower. Now there's a lot of different things that could be happening here. And again, we kind of have to wait till the end of this episode to talk about all of it, but there is a power struggle here now between Gaius and Quintus even more so than the words before. Gaius had always been the one that is lower than Quintus, but now we're seeing as Gaius has kept his cool, Gaius is in control, and while he doesn't have more authority than Quintus through the Roman powers, right, just in his emotions and who he is as a person, we see him much more calm, collected, and ready to take care of things than Quintus is at this moment, kind of raging and going off the handle. So in this moment, Quintus gives him an ultimatum. He says, you're going to shrink tent city by 10 cubits a day, or I will demote you uh, to a centurion or something even less. And of course, Gaius repeats it back to him and he kind of nonchalantly is kind of going along with this, but I don't think he has any intention of actually following the orders that Quintus is giving him. As we move away from that Roman scene, we go back to our apostles as we see James and John visiting mom and dad yet again. We've got Salome and Zebedee who are in the house and they're just having a nice sort of sit down, getting back together after some travels that the boys had been doing. Now, we've seen from the last episode as Peter got his new name, that James and John obviously are the ones that are most concerned about this. This is a big issue for them, and they were worried that their mom was going to find out. And so at first, they try to hide this fact from their mom, and this becomes quite a little issue, right, as they're kind of sitting there and their parents can tell there's something that they're not telling them. So eventually it does come out that Peter got a new name and he is the rock, right? Um, and so the family begins to kind of talk through this situation. What do they do with this? And Salome in particular seems to be mm, a little bit off put by this. She says specifically that these boys, her boys, have done five times as much as Simon has ever done for Jesus. And she starts listing off these different things that they've done for the ministry throughout the time they've been following Jesus. Now, of course, this is for sure like soccer mom jealousy here, right? They're part of the team, but they're not getting as much recognition as someone else on the team. And of course, Jesus picked Peter for a reason. There's a reason why James and John are in a different position than Peter is. And we're going to see that unfold, I'm sure, through the rest of Jesus' ministry and into the early church as everything kind of happens there. But Salome doesn't really understand that, and she's quite upset, so much so that she actually takes a part of Jesus' sermon and kind of misinterprets it and skews it to be what she wants it to be, which is a very common thing we see nowadays. She thinks back to the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, ask and it will be given, seek and you shall find, knock and the door will be opened to you. She takes that and misinterprets it to say, you will get whatever you ask for. Now, Zebedee tries to kind of correct her throughout this entire conversation. I thought it was a really brilliant way of showing from the writers how they're thinking through this and how it's going to be interpreted by an audience. Of course, the audience, we're thinking, no, you're misinterpreting that. Of course, it's not anything that you want, but rather, if you're in the will of God, he's going to present you with these different things throughout that time. If you're building the kingdom, of course, he's going to help you do that, right? It's a completely different thing when you say, this is my will, even if it's something that you deem to be good, God isn't going to fulfill those things just because you tell him that you want them. It's not the way that it works. A lot of people even today misunderstand this. Salome is very defensive of her boys. She asks them, do you want this influence? Do you want the blessings that come from you being close to God? If you don't do this now, someone else is going to get in front of you. And so the boys start thinking to themselves and they agree. <laughs> they think, okay, well, if we have to ask for this, we should ask for it. And maybe we could get more authority. 
Maybe we could build the kingdom better in our own way because we've asked for this new authority, right? They really want to be the people for Jesus. And it's it's like they're taking the good thing of following Jesus and they're kind of diminishing it with their own selfishness and their own pride, which of, of course we're going to see played out later on, I believe in episode four. Now, a really key quote to this scene in particular is when Salome says, if you don't ask, I may have to ask myself. Now we've been shown a scene from Dallas previously on a live stream a few months ago where it showed part of episode four after the point in which James and John ask to sit at the left and right of Jesus in heaven. Now, they kind of made this seem like James and John were going to ask, but I am almost 100% sure that Salome is going to be the one to ask. And the reason why there's a differentiation here is because in Scripture, there's two different versions. For example, we have this version in Matthew chapter 20, where we see the mother's request. So it says the mother of the sons of Zebedee came up with him, uh, came up to him with her sons and kneeling uh, before, uh, before him, she asked him for something. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, say that these two sons of mine are to sit one on your right and one on your left in your kingdom. And so we see that the mother is asking here, there is another scripture, basically a parallel scripture that has the sons asking this. So it could have been that all of them asked kind of together, Uh, maybe the mother starting and then the son's joining in. And so in scripture, we're seeing uh, that kind of happen there. I wonder how they're going to do it in the chosen, but my guess is that Salome is going to have a big part to play here because she is kind of this hard figure who is really pushing for everything as we see so far in episode three. Next up, we return to the love story, the engagement storyline in The Chosen Thomas and Rhema. We see as Thomas and John are actually packing a bag and John is giving him supplies in order to go on a picnic with Rhema to talk with her about the Kiddushin. If you didn't watch our last episode, the Kiddushin is all about uh, an, an engagement basically in Jewish culture. And so that's what they're doing. They're preparing for all of that. The last thing to take care of is the mohar, which is a bride price that Thomas is supposed to give to Rama in order to fulfill this version of the Kiddushin here with Jesus and John kind of signing off on everything for the two of them. Now we see as uh, they enter into the mission house where all the women are currently working on making olive oil. So Rama, Tamar, Mary, and some others are sitting here making the olive oil, getting it ready so that they can basically sell it and continue to make money for the the ministry. We see as John and uh, Thomas walk into the room, Thomas asks Rama if he'll go if she'll go on a walk with him. And then we see as the scene kind of plays out awkwardly, Rama finally kind of understands what he's doing and she goes along with him. And there's a funny moment here when they're trying to figure out who's going to chaperone. Nathaniel of course being as blunt as he is, he says, "I would but I don't want to. (laughs) And so then they call over Andrew to chaperone for this little picnic. Then we go out to the outskirts of Capernaum near some road out there. And we see as Thomas and Rama are now having a picnic and he begins to explain, we have everything that we need for the Kiddushin. We've got John and Jesus ready to sign off on it. And all that's left is the Mohar or the bride price. And so he gives her a present. Now this present is not only going to tie in uh, to the beginning of the episode, but it's also going to tie into the end of the episode. This is really, really key, not only to this love story, but also to the overall theme that's going on in this episode. We see as Thomas gives her a sundial. Now, what does a sundial represent? It represents time. It represents the passage of time. And so what did we talk about in the very beginning of this episode? We see as David and Bathsheba also talk about time. Bathsheba says, so it's a separation then for a time. And, and David repeats, it could be a long time, it could be a short time, it could be today, it could be, you know, years from now, but there is going to be a time in which a separation takes place. This is going to be really key for us to understand the end of this episode and what the writers were trying to do. This is a very intelligent way of kind of showing us why this sundial is so important. Thomas gives Raymond the sundial and he tells her all these lovey-dovey things like when he spoke with her, he would lose track of time, which wasn't normal for him. Or when they were together, it's like time stopped altogether. And in the end of the day, he says that we will be together for the rest of time. So there's a really, really good reason for why they keep on using time over and over again, just like I mentioned. Now, something else that I'll start to mention throughout the rest of this episode as well is that there is not a happy moment 
at all during this episode. Even during the scenes that are supposed to be happy and victorious, there is constantly a rising tension. And specifically, that's done through the music that Matt and Dan have put together for this episode. I think it's expertly done. For example, this moment with Thomas and Rayma. This is supposed to be a lovey-dovey, happy sort of moment. And while we do have a couple of those notes kind of going on throughout the music, the majority of the music is really a tension-building ominous sort of feeling and of course if you've seen the episode you know exactly what it's building up to this is really really interesting because it's not just this moment but also other moments that i'll point out as we go through them you don't get this satisfying sort of like ah this is a happy moment sort of feeling you begin to dread what is to come it's almost like you're waiting for the shoe to drop. Hey, if you're enjoying this video so far and you want to be part of a community that loves The Chosen as much as you do, then you can go to snipesupport.com. We've got a lot of different chat rooms over there where you can talk about The Chosen and everything that's upcoming in The Chosen Season 4. Right now, we have a huge group of people talking about episodes 1 through 3, talking about all the spoilers and everything else that happened during those episodes. It's really, really a lot of fun. So if you want to be part of that, go to snipesupport.com. It's seriously the best way to help us to continue to make videos just like this. Let's get back to the episode. Then quickly, before we get to the meat of this episode, we get a small moment with Rabbi Akiva, and he is relaying the edict that they received from Jerusalem back in episode two. Akiva is now telling everybody in the synagogue that this is their new mission. We are to trip up Jesus. We are to talk to him. We are to twist him up in his own words in order to show people that he's a fake, in order to show people that he is not who he says that he is. And of course, Rabbi Akiva has been trying to do this, but now everybody else is going to join in and basically become the Pharisees that we know from scripture. Now Jairus hears this as well and is kind of worried a little bit, although we don't really get a big scene from him in this moment here. Then we jump into what takes up most of this episode, which is Jesus's sermon that's about to happen. We're right now preparing for Jesus' sermon as they're in Peter's house, and now Jesus is kind of eating. We see Mary and Eden preparing food for him, and they say that they are preparing food because he often gets very tired and exhausted after a sermon, so they're trying to get ahead of it to make sure that he has the energy to do what he needs to do. Now, while he's kind of preparing and eating some food, we see two different conversations happen within Peter's house. The first one is James and John, as they're still continuing to talk about how they're going to ask Jesus about sitting on his left and right. What is this actually going to look like and when are they going to do it? They're kind of planning out what this is going to be for them. But then we also see a really interesting conversation between Peter and Matthew. Remember at the end of last episode, we saw that Peter forgave Matthew and now everything is kind of moving forward. Matthew is calling Peter by his new name. Peter is treating Matthew like he's a normal human being and he's talking to him about kind of what's going on. But yet this is another ominous undertone that we're getting in this episode. We see as Peter comes up to Matthew and Matthew's looking out the window like he's scared a little bit and he asks him are you looking for a lion <laughs> because he looks like he's mm, under duress a little bit he says that he spoke to Gaius about the upcoming meeting and Gaius was very worried he didn't want there to be a big group meeting like this he says it's dangerous um, and that it could be an issue which of course we're going to see if that's the case in a little bit but of course, these two, it's really cool to see them having a normal conversation, not being passive aggressive or not being kind of bullied or, uh, or anything else kind of happening here like we've seen in the past with Peter several times. Um, it's really, really cool to see this, this new relationship being formed. It's not like they're best of friends, but they're definitely getting closer as we see these things kind of happening throughout the season. One important thing to bring up here as well is that Peter specifically says that he thinks that this sermon is a bad idea. They've brought too much attention to themselves in Capernaum, and he is not the one that's calling the shots for this. However, he does trust Jesus and he's going to follow him no matter what. Just be prepared to deal with whatever comes. They can't avoid every single conflict is what he says. Then we get to the beginning of the biblical section and the teaching that Jesus is going to do here in Capernaum. They approach the synagogue and they meet up with Barnaby and Shula. This is really cool because Barnaby and Shula begin to tell them about the edict that has been sent out by Jerusalem. None of the apostles or Jesus have really found out about this 
quite yet. The only people that really knew are the people in the synagogue that received the edict in the first place, Jairus and Yusuf, who has now gone off to Jerusalem. So now they're being told about this new edict that names Jesus specifically, and they're not super worried about it. Of course, Jesus is going to continue to do what he's going to do. And of course, maybe to poke the bear a little bit after hearing about the edict, he continues on to the gate of the synagogue where there is a man sitting who is blind. We get a couple really cool connections here, even beyond the scripture that we're about to see. On the sleuthy end of things, we see as Shula actually tells us that she was not blind from birth, but rather she had a malady that caused her to become blind. We didn't really know that before. We weren't sure about her history or what actually happened to her. But in this circumstance, of course, to make this miracle what it is in scripture, they had to clarify that for us because no one had ever been cured from blindness that was from birth. Um, and so now we see that Shula wasn't blind from birth, but she had something that happened to her. However, this man that we're talking to here, Uzziah, was blind from birth. And Shula and Barnaby have known him for quite a while, as he, I'm sure, is begging for money and different things, uh, since he can't really get around and do what someone else would do in Capernaum during that time. Now, we see this specifically in Scripture in John chapter 9. As we jump into this, we can read some of this as what's, uh, what's happening here, and then I'll go into what's happening in the show. So Jesus heals a man born blind. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was blind from birth. Now, that's basically what happens here in the show, but a few things are kind of different. But before we get to those differences, let me tell you what happens in the show. In the show, as Jesus looks at Uzziah, Shula says, but you can't, knowing that he's trying to heal him. And he says, why not? She says, it's Shabbat. And he says, that'll just make this more fun. But of course, Jesus moves forward and begins talking to Uzziah. Someone from the crowd around him, a friend of Uzziah's, says, was it him or his parents that sinned in order to make him like this? And Jesus says, just like he does in scripture, it's not his parents or him that sinned, but so that the glory of God could be seen through him. And we see that again in John chapter nine. Jesus answered, it was not that the man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, night is coming, when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. This is a really key thing, especially in the gospel of John. Now we've heard of Jesus referred to as the light of the world, probably hundreds if not thousands of times throughout our lives. But what he means by that is this whole night and day metaphor. It's the day in which Jesus is here on earth doing these miracles, showing people that he's the Messiah. Night is swiftly coming when he will no longer be on earth as he is in his human body. So it'll be much different. Things will happen differently during that time. And it's important for people to realize that while he's here so that they understand who he is. And of course, this is a major theme of season four, specifically because Jesus is getting frustrated at the people for not understanding, right? He's telling them what's happening, but a lot of them don't have faith or eyes to see what is happening during a lot of this. It's, I'm sure, quite frustrating to the human side of things for Jesus, absolutely. Then after this point, as I'm sure you've heard from scripture, Jesus takes some spit and some dirt to make mud and puts it over Uzziah's eyes. Now here is where he tells him to wash off his eyes and then he is able to see he's healed. But this is a pretty major difference from scripture here as this doesn't even happen in Capernaum at all. And I think that's a pretty significant change. I don't think it changes the overall theme or what the chosen is trying to say here, but it does change the miracle as in scripture, we see as this man actually is told to go to the pool of Siloam. Now, this shows us that obviously it's in Jerusalem where the pool of Siloam is, and the pool of Siloam is interconnected with the temple. I think this is a really big point that is kind of missed here, changing the miracle to Capernaum. While I don't think it changes massive, massive themes or hurts this story for, the, for what we're trying to basically communicate in this episode— it definitely changes the story. So you should know that this happens in Jerusalem, not in Capernaum. However, a lot of these other things happen almost exactly as it does in scripture. Some of the Pharisees come out and they see Uzziah as he's healed and people begin to freak out. They don't even believe that this is Uzziah anymore because he's been healed and they've always known him as the person that was blind, especially blind 
from birth. And this is something that comes into question pretty quickly, specifically for the Pharisees here. We see as some of the Pharisees bring Uzziah into the synagogue in front of Jairus and Akiva, and Akiva begins to question him as to what's happening. As he's being pulled into the synagogue, he actually calls for his parents, and so somebody goes and finds his parents as well. There's a funny moment here as well as Uzziah says to go get his parents. They ask, where do they live? And Shula says, how would I know? I was blind the whole time I knew him. <laughs> and as Jesus starts to teach, we see that the crowd starts to become bigger and bigger. Then we focus in on a character named Jed, who we met last season in season three during episodes four and five. We see that he is actually the one who tried to turn in Veronica for being unclean when everybody was trying to rush in on Jesus. So he's been in Tent City for quite some time at this point. He actually rushes back to his family quietly and tries to get them to come see Jesus without anybody else noticing. But you can quickly see that all of these people from Tent city are migrating into the city because they've heard about Jesus beginning to teach, which is what they're here for in the first place. Then we jump into the synagogue and see as Akiva is actually questioning the man born blind. They ask him questions like, are you sure you were born blind? How did this happen? Who did this to you? And while he doesn't have a lot of answers, he knows that Jesus must be a prophet. He must be from God because how could anybody do this if they're not from God? And we see this perfectly represented in scripture as well. I really love the way in which they did this scene in particular. Here again in John chapter 9, we see some of the Pharisees said this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. This is represented by Akiva saying that this man is a sinner. But then they say, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was a division among them. So this is kind of the division here is Jairus and Akiva. Akiva saying that he's a sinner, Jairus kind of defending him a little bit. And we see that the man born blind is in this conversation as well as they ask him, what do you think about this man? Who is this man? And he says that he is a prophet. We see that basically exactly represented in the show here. And it becomes really, really a unique thing as we see the man born blind talking about what's actually going on here. And he's obviously flabbergasted. He's seeing for the first time. And then his parents come into the picture, which we see in scripture again. Here we see as his parents come in, and they didn't know what to do, <laughs> his parents answered, we know that he is our son and that he is born blind. Obviously, they recognized him. This isn't a new man. This isn't someone else. They've never seen this done before that a man was born blind blind and then he was healed so this is something that's completely different now they begin to answer some of the questions but they say you can just ask him he's of age he can speak for himself um and they basically said this because they were afraid of the pharisees right we see right here verse 22 his parents said these things because they feared the jews for the jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed jesus to be the christ he was to be put out of the synagogue this is actually represented really really well in the episode as well as the parents begin to say oh yeah we've heard that jesus is and then they just say you know what he can answer for himself. <laughs> we don't need to, we don't need to answer that question. He's an adult. He can answer for himself. <laughs> so they're basically trying to save themselves because they don't want to declare that Jesus is the Christ, even if they might believe it uh, because of this new edict, because of these things that are happening. Right. Uh, so definitely in the show and in scripture, this is very, very, very congruent. I love the way that these scenes are written really brings you into scripture hundred percent. Then we get to the crux of this scene, which is a huge moment in scripture. And you, You've probably heard this phrasing over and over again throughout the time that you've been a Christian, and that is this. He answered, whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, though, I was blind and now I see. This was a really, really cool moment in the show. We actually see as Jairus gives a fist bump kind of silently to himself. He's kind of like, yes, <laughs> as, uh, as the blind man that was healed says these words. And of course, it's a very powerful moment uh, in the show as well. Now, I want to say throughout this entire time, even during the moment that Jesus is healing the blind man, the same thing continues that I mentioned earlier, the music here. Normally during a healing, there's like this beautiful, like, loud kind of triumphant music we hear uh you know our vocalist in the background kind of giving all of these runs and different things that are really bringing up the energy right in this moment however there is still that ominous sort of tension building music here it's not victorious it's not like hey we're done with this miracle 
like I said earlier, it's like you're waiting for the other shoe to drop. Then at the very end of the scene here, we see another scriptural moment where the Pharisees are really offended by this man. Now, this is a very abridged version of what the scripture actually says when he says, uh, I was born blind, but now I see. Then right after that, the Pharisees kind of get upset and they kind of cast him out by saying this line, you were born in utter sin and you would teach us. And then they cast him and his parents out. Um, now in the scriptures, it's actually much cooler than this. Cause there's this whole section here that he is legitimately like preaching to these men um, and, and telling him that, but they kind of end it with uh with this moment up here uh, where he says, I was blind and now I see. Then they jump into uh, you were born under sin. So they kind of skip over that middle portion there. Really, really good stuff there. If you get a chance to read it, John chapter nine, really, really cool. Then as everybody, storms out of the synagogue this is where we get one of the biggest moments of episode three and that is the seven woes to the pharisees akiva and rabbi josiah come out of the synagogue and begin talking with jesus now we know rabbi akiva from last season as he was a big part of Jairus' story as well as episode six where we see him in the courtyard talking with uh the disciples of john and jesus there and now we're seeing him as he is really the new shmuel of capernaum he is the head pharisee that we're really seeing as the antagonist to jesus but we know rabbi josiah as well as he's been mentioned all the way back from episode three of season one even though he didn't really have a name back then other than from the kids in episode three and then he was kind of unnamed in episode eight of season one but we've seen him you know throughout basically in season three he made an appearance and now he's really making his first bigger appearance uh, in this episode here so these are the pharisees that are really the focus of jesus's um you know, outburst here as he talks through the seven woes of the Pharisees. And there's a lot of other intricate things that kind of happen here as well. Mainly this whole section is based on Luke chapter 11 and Matthew chapter 23. If you want to read those chapters there, as the Pharisees are approaching Jesus and getting ready to challenge him, Jesus is teaching and he's talking about these different things. And he mentions specifically the queen of the South. Now this is from Luke chapter 11, where he's talking about the sign of Jonah. Specifically, he brings up the queen of the South, which we know from scripture scripture is, is referencing the queen of Sheba who came to learn from Solomon. Now Jesus is using this as a metaphor. Obviously that queen is long gone. She's been dead for many, many, many years, but he's talking about the queen as an outsider. So you can think of the queen of Sheba or the queen of the South as the Gentiles and how the Gentiles are going to come and condemn the current generation of Jews who are not listening to something that's greater than Solomon and that is Jesus. And so he's claiming to be greater than Solomon. He's telling them that the Gentiles are going to come and basically look at the treasure and the knowledge that he has and take it while a lot of the Jews are not going to. And of course, we see that happen later on. I don't think a lot of people are understanding what he's actually saying here, but there's a really, really cool moment here that we're going to be teaching from later on as we do our deep dives into this moment as well. As Jesus teaches here, you can actually hear a woman in the crowd say, blessed is the womb who bore you. And we see this actually in Luke chapter 11 as well. We see as a woman uh, shouts out, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breasts at which you nursed. And he said, blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And we see this kind of connected to some of the other things that he's teaching here, which is really, really cool. Now, right as we get into the seven woes of the Pharisees, Atticus actually has a moment with Gaius as well. Atticus can very keenly see that there is something that is about to happen here. This crowd is getting really riled up. The Pharisees are getting very angry and Jesus is about to let loose in this situation. So he goes over to Gaius and tells him that Quintus needs to deal with this. And he sends a secret message with him as well to tell Quintus directly. Now Gaius does not want to leave here. One, he wants to hear what Jesus has to say, and he's keeping an eye on the crowd here. So he tells Julius, the Roman soldier that he's been with for the majority of season three and four, to go and relay this message to Quintus, giving the secret message that Atticus gave him as well. This is when we get to the moment with Jesus and the seven woes to the Pharisees. Now, the seven woes to the Pharisees are when Jesus really lets loose and lets the Pharisees know exactly what he thinks of them and exactly what they're doing wrong. They're worried about the wrong things. They're worried about their outward appearance when they should be worried about their inward understanding of who God is and how to go about life as a follower of God. But they kind of misunderstand things. And because of that, they teach the wrong things to all the Jewish people as well, which I'm sure is very frustrating to Jesus as he's trying to teach them what's correct. They've taken the law and they've twisted it and turned it into something that it's not supposed to be. And so now they're worried about things like uncleanliness 
or the Sabbath over the things of God that are really, truly important. Now we see this represented in several different places, but Luke chapter 11 and Matthew 23 are the two that I've been focusing on overall. For example, here in verse 37, 38, we see that Jesus begins by talking to the Pharisees and saying, now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools, did not he who made the outside make the inside also? Then we see this again represented in Matthew 23, as he goes on and on and on into the Pharisees and tells them all of these seven woes in which they're taking for granted. He calls them whitewashed tombs, uh, different things like that, where he's showing them you're, you're thinking about the wrong things. You're focused on the wrong priorities. You need to be focused on the things of God and not in the way that you think the things of God are going to be, but the truth of the matter. So it's really an interesting scene trying to get them to understand the truth and yet they just do not. And we see also that throughout this scene and throughout the rest of the confrontation with the Pharisees, they're getting riled up and they're trying to catch Jesus in his words, like the edict told them to earlier on. But of course, they can't do that. <laughs> Jesus is the truth and he knows the truth there. And of course, he's going to say whatever he's going to say. Now, they kind of challenge him over and over again, and he just tells them, oh, I'm just getting started. We see specifically that the crowd is getting really upset that the Pharisees are kind of stealing this moment. Jesus was teaching them. He was talking to them. Them. That's what they've been waiting for forever in the tent city. And so now the Pharisees are ruining this moment, getting upset at Jesus for what he's teaching. And they're trying to teach something opposite of what Jesus is teaching. So it's becoming this annoying thing that they are not really sure what is going on. And everybody is getting kind of upset and riled up. You see, as people are starting to begin getting trampled and different things are happening there in the crowd and the apostles are trying to figure out what to do here. We even see as Gaius approaches Matthew and tells him to get Jesus out of here because it's way too dangerous. He tells him to go let Simon know that it's too dangerous and they need to get everybody out. And Matthew, of course, corrects him and says, it's Peter now. We can see as the tension is rising and rising, it's beginning to come to a boiling point. Then we see as Julius actually goes to the office of Quintus and delivers that message where we finally hear that secret message from Atticus. Atticus tells Quintus, what you do next will determine your career. Now, of course, this is hearkening back to what Atticus talked to Quintus about earlier. He knows that Quintus is on a fine thread and he is poised to kind of lose his career here, be replaced by someone else that can deal with it better or someone who can deal with it harsher. So, Atticus is right here, but he also kind of riles up Quintus. And again, Quintus runs out and begins to go and try to solve things himself. We cut back to the crowd and it becomes more and more intense. Peter came up with an idea in order to get everybody out of here. And they're trying to execute it with Simon Z and some of the other apostles. They're trying to get Jesus out of here safely. It's getting way too dangerous. We see as Thomas leaves Ramah with Mary as to keep her safe there. And we also hear as Jesus is teaching in the background, Luke chapter eight and Luke chapter 12. One thing that I did find a little bit weird here in the background is they use the same kind of voice voiceover a couple of different times just in the background of Jesus teaching he actually teaches the same thing a couple of different times I'm not sure if that was an intentional thing for him to be like repeating it uh, I don't know why he would do that back to back uh, but there is the same kind of voice line here talking about the leaven of the Pharisees and kind of getting into that not that this is the super focal point of what Jesus is teaching but here are some of the things that he's talking about as it's kind of the background kind of going on uh, right here we're in uh, Luke chapter 8 and verse 17 here, he says this, for nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be made known and come to light. Take care then how you hear for the one who has, uh, who has more will be given and from the one who has not, even what he thinks he has will be taken away. So that's a portion of what we saw there. Um, we also see this line here. My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word and God and do uh, word of God and do it. Um, we hear that as well during this point. Then we also hear uh, this section here, Jesus talking about the Pharisees in particular. This is Luke chapter 12. He says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. So kind of the same thing that we're seeing in that uh, previous chapter there. Of course, this is probably things that Jesus repeated uh, over and over again. Therefore, whatever you have said in the dark shall be heard in the light and what you have whispered in private rooms shall be proclaimed on the rooftops. So um, really, really cool stuff here. However, I do want to mention this because uh, we're going to come back to it in just a second. Right after this verse that we hear Jesus speak about here, he talks about not having fear. And this is really uh, 
a, a cool point as well. He says, I tell you, my friends, do not fear those who kill the body and after that have nothing more that they can do. This, I think at the very least, is interesting that this is right near some of the scriptures that Jesus is teaching about and maybe has something to do with this episode. Coming into the climax of this episode, we see a lot of different things happen. First of all, let's talk about the Romans. We see as Atticus comes into the play with Gaius again. He says, you haven't even moved a cubit. You haven't moved at all. Why aren't you going to get Quintus? Why aren't you dealing with this? Then he thinks to himself, what plan does Gaius have here? And I'm not sure that Gaius necessarily has a big plan here, but Atticus is starting to try to dissect what is going on with Gaius. He thinks to himself, one, Jesus got to him. Jesus, you know, he, he's wanting to listen to Jesus now. He's wanting to be a follower of Jesus. This may be slightly true, but Atticus isn't quite sure if that's the case. That's the first thing that he comes to. Second, he thinks maybe he wants Quintus to fail. You're wanting Quintus to fail here. You're wanting things to fall on him and for him to get blamed for everything that's happening here. Atticus goes with this later suggestion because it makes more sense for a Roman soldier. A Roman soldier, of course, is wanting to be ambitious. They're wanting to climb the ranks. They want power and authority. And so Atticus kind of admires Gaius in this moment for what he's going to do here. But Atticus does warn Gaius if this is his ambition, he says, you're taking a huge gamble here. Either you or Quintus are not going to survive this. And this is when we get a big moment that we've really been waiting for from Gaius and Quintus. Quintus rushes through the crowd and tells Gaius that he must arrest Jesus now. This happens three separate times. And every time, Gaius says no. Not giving an excuse, not saying why he can't, not giving another solution, just straight up telling him no. No. And you see, I think these three times are actually really significant. I think it's not only a parallel to some of the other things we see in scripture, for example, Peter denying Christ and then re-accepting him three times, but the number three in Jewish society holds really key significance. It's almost a legally binding type of thing that's happening here. If seven is the number of perfection, three is kind of the number of legality. And so Quintus is denying him three times, and I'm sure the writers did that very specifically for whatever reason they decided to do that. This was a really cool moment where we're seeing Gaius stand his ground. No matter what, he was not going to arrest Jesus. And every single time, Quintus kind of ups the ante. And at the end, he says, arrest Jesus or you will hang. And Gaius says, I will not. And that is when he tells Julius to arrest Gaius. And that's what we see of him. Now, stick around. I'm going to make a whole nother video talking about the future of Quintus and Gaius and what's going to be happening there because there's some really interesting things. But hang on for that. That's probably going to be coming out tomorrow. Then after arresting Gaius, he makes the situation even worse by yelling at all the rest of the Roman soldiers and telling all of them to arrest Jesus right now. This is where everything goes off the rails. We see as everybody just begins chaotically kind of running around, either trying to get out of the situation, try to get closer to Jesus, or just get out of the way of the Roman soldiers. People are being pushed everywhere, and Jesus and the apostles can barely make it out. We see as Peter and the rest of the apostles start to execute the plan in which Peter put in place earlier, as they get Jesus out of here and try to get him away from all of this danger. It's really, really intense. But a lot of the members we can't keep track of. There's a lot of people that are missing in the crowd and different things that are happening. Specifically, Thomas looks for Rhema. He left her with Mary originally, but even Mary doesn't know where she went. So Thomas begins to look for Rhema amidst the crowd, thinking she might have gotten trampled or something else is happening with her. It's a really, really intense moment and the music is building, the crowd is building, the tension is building. Now, during all of this chaos, Quintus makes his way towards the front near the synagogue. God gate. Here he's being pushed around by different people, including Thomas as he's trying to get through and looking for Rama and different things are happening here. Quintus actually falls to the ground at one point, gets up and takes out his sword as to intimidate the people around him. He knows that he has no control in this situation. It's getting really, really rough. As Thomas gets into the crowd, he does finally find Rama and everything is super intense here. 
He tries to get out of the crowd, but the only way to go is past Quintus near the synagogue gate. Quintus continues to scream out, where is he? Looking for Jesus, trying to arrest him, trying to solve this issue so that he can fix all of his problems with Rome. And as Thomas and Rhema pass by, the rage fills his eyes. He questions Thomas, where is he? And stabs forward as Thomas ignores him and walks away. This is where the music stops. The camera slowly pans and we see as Rhema has been impaled by Quintus' sword. Now, during this whole point, we see as Quintus is even shocked at what he has just done. He knows the ramifications of this, and this could be a pretty big deal. Atticus, as well, grabs Quintus and tears him to the side. We don't know the aftermath of what's going to happen there, but I definitely have some theories. This, of course, is the moment that everybody has been talking about for the past three episodes. Rhema dies and as we see here her last words are i want you to follow him thomas that's all i want i want you to and then she breathes her last as she wants thomas to follow jesus that's all she wants at this point rama is gone completely she's no longer breathing we hear mary's screams and thomas's cries as it cuts over to Jesus and the apostles as they walk out, Peter talking about the plan and what they are to do next, then we see as Jesus turns around, acknowledging what's just happened. He begins to walk back towards the crowd, back towards the synagogue, and stand in front of Thomas, where we hear this exchange of words. Thomas looks up and sees that Jesus has returned, and he looks over to him and says, Heal her. Fix this. You're here now, Rabbi, please. This was a mistake. Jesus just looks at Thomas and he says, I'm so sorry. Not out of guilt that this is his fault, but out of the situation in general. The fact that Thomas has to feel these feelings at this moment. Thomas then screams out in pain. Rabbi, you don't have to let this happen. Just take it back. Just take it back. She might not be dead yet. You can heal, right? Jesus responds specifically with, it's not her time. I love you, Thomas. He loves you. I'm so sorry. And that is where the episode ends. As Thomas and Mary cry, the apostles look on in shock, and the episode goes to the credits. This is one of the most impactful moments so far for a character in this show. Of course, we've seen John the Baptist die, but we knew that was coming. This, of course, is an extra biblical character, and it offers a lot of different talking points here. Now, you guys wanted to know what my thoughts overall were about Rhema. I thought that this was really well done. I think that this is an amazing moment in television, not just in Christian television, but really, truly amazing writing building up to this season four, episode three moment. This shows us not only what the rest of the season is going to feel like, but also prepares us for the future of what episodes are going to be like in season five and season six and season seven. There's a lot that's going to be upcoming that is going to be really, really intense. And we have to be prepared for that. Now, as far as Jesus not healing Rhema, is this something that's biblical? Well, I would say definitely so. There are a lot of people that would have died around Jesus, even if they believed in him. For example, what about Joseph, his father? We know that Joseph wasn't around during the time of Jesus' ministry or during his crucifixion. He's not mentioned at any point later on in Mary's life. So what happened there, right? He had to have died, most likely. So Jesus just decided not to resurrect him either? God has a purpose for things. And I think this episode has showed us a lot of understanding of that, right? Talking back again about the bookends of this episode. We start with David and talking about how his child dies, and yet David will still worship him anyway. There are times when God chooses not to heal, and we can't pretend like we understand why that is. We can't pretend like we understand every single aspect of God's will and what's kind of going on there. Let's hypothetically say this is a real story, and Rama died. Well, God has his purposes, there is something that happens because Rama's dead that wouldn't happen if she was alive. And we could never determine what that is because God is the only one that can see the trillion, quadrillion, you know, immensity of, of the choices that we make and the things that are happening in the world. Only he knows all of those things. Only he knows how many breaths you've taken and the hairs that are on your head. 
God is the only one that's in that situation. He's the only one with that authority and power. And so who are we to say what's going on here and why Jesus didn't raise her? Now, if you do have an issue with this specific scene here and what happened, there are other people that agree with you, even people on the chosen team, such as Julie Molina. So let's take a look at this. And when I finished watching these episodes, I was actually with a couple other people and sitting on the couch and, you know, I'm bawling because we're all bawling, right? Mm -hmm. These episodes are, are strong and they're beautiful. Um, I wasn't surprised by the storyline. I knew that was coming. So it wasn't that. It was seeing the way in which Jesus reacted in that moment. And as soon as the episodes are over, I'm bawling, you know, and all I can, all I can say, I can't say anything else other than, that's not my Jesus. So here is a really interesting conversation. If you want to watch that, the live stream is still up on um, the chosen page, including a new scene that they showed us that I broke down on this channel. If you want to check that out as well, Julie's uh, kind of concern here is that she thinks that's not my Jesus. And this comes from personal experience that she had um, where her mother passed away and she was in that exact situation that Thomas was in. And she felt like Jesus comforted her in that situation that he hugged her and loved on her and told her that, you know, to have peace, basically. Um, now, Dallas defends this by saying that Thomas, in that situation, wouldn't have wanted that hug. He wouldn't have wanted Jesus to do something, right? And that all of us are different in those moments. So while Julie may wanted, may have wanted Jesus to hug her and, and give her comfort, other people would not have responded in that same way. And Jesus obviously takes each of us individually. I can definitely see that there. But I also think that Jesus, again, isn't one that is going to, one, uh, heal everybody that's sick. We see that in scripture that he does not heal every single person that asks him to. Um, he does not heal every single person that he encounters. Uh, there's just, it just doesn't happen. There are specific things that we see in scripture that he does. And I'm sure thousands and thousands and thousands of other people that he met in which he didn't even interact with because we're only getting a certain portion of what Jesus did in scripture. Right. Um, but even beyond that, I think that Jesus is going to interact with all of us differently. And so he knows Thomas. He knows what Thomas needs to do in the future. He knows who Thomas is becoming. And he knows that this is part of Thomas's path. Now, I have a lot of theories as well. I don't want to dive too deep on the whole Rhema thing because there are some really interesting things that we're going to talk about in a future episode coming up very soon as well. So I will talk about all of that. We'll do our deep dives on everything that we've talked about in this episode. But that overall is episode three of season four. There's a lot that's gonna come past this point. And so there's a couple of things I wanna talk about before we see the next couple episodes. So make sure you're subscribed and you like this episode as we get into that. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. I'd love to hear it. There's so much here. <laughs> I hope you guys like this episode. We'll see you on the next one. Peace. <laughs>